Hello everyone, welcome to my channel. I am Passionate Kelsey. If you only know me from YouTube, um, I'm assuming that you know this as well, but I have a crochet business and I've had a crochet business since I was 18. I am now 24, so it's been quite a while. I do full-time crochet and YouTube. This is my only job. And we're making this video today so that I can answer some of your guys' questions about how to start a crochet business. A lot of these questions are pulled from an Instagram story post that I did. I asked people to ask me questions on how to start a crochet business, so a lot of the questions are from there. Some of the questions are just questions that I get a lot in my DMs and stuff like that, so why don't we get started? The first question that I get the most often is, where do I even start? If you are looking to start a crochet business, the most important place you should start is with crocheting. You're going to need some yarn, a hook, and some scissors. Obviously. <laughs> start making things, start honing in your skills. You really wanna find your passion and figure out what you're good at. While you're starting out with crocheting, if you think that this is going to turn into a business someday, a huge suggestion that I have is to start your social media early. I don't mean posting about your crochet on your already existing personal socials. I mean make an entirely new page dedicated to your crochet projects. Start posting about them, start posting about the process, get people interested, and start acquiring your followers early. That is really going to help you in the long run. Our next question is, how expensive is it to start a crochet business? In my opinion, I would say that starting a crochet business is not necessarily expensive at all, really. You will be needing the money for the yarn and the hooks and any other materials, but if you are already crocheting as a hobby, then turning it into a business shouldn't be much work as far as money goes. So if you're already crocheting items, really to sell them, all you're gonna need to do is take photos. You don't need to buy a fancy camera or anything like that. You can just use your phone. Making your social media pages is free. Posting is free. If you're going to start selling on a website, most of them have fees, but if you want to start off really kind of low key, you can sell items via messages. You know, just have someone send you a message, you can exchange information, you can get them to PayPal you or Venmo you, give you their address, and then you can ship the item from there. Etsy is a really great place to start if you're looking for somewhere that is not going to charge you very many fees. And that is because opening an Etsy store is free. You can go make an account, pick out a name, make a shop with no fees right now. The only fees start whenever you begin listing an item for sale. And the fee is just 20 cents per item. After that 20 cents listing fee, you won't have to pay anything else unless the listing expires, or if you sell the listing, then you'll have to pay the fees, but you will have money from the sale to pay those fees anyway. So just overall, there are ways to do it without having it cost a lot of money to start your business. Our next question is how do you decide what to make and sell? You should sell things that you are good at making. If you are really good at making stuffed animals, and not necessarily great at making clothing items, then I would say you should sell stuffed animals. If it's the other way around, you're not really good at stuffed animals, and you're pretty good at clothing, you should sell clothing. The best item that you can crochet is the thing that you should sell. Our next question is a question that I get all the time, and it is, how do I price my crochet items? This question is a little bit silly coming from me because my answer for myself is that I price based on vibes and I mean that's not necessarily like a great process <laughs> but that's just what works for me. Most people would suggest that you use a formula to price your items such as the cost of the yarn plus the amount of hours that it took you to make times your hourly rate equals the cost of the product. For example, if I was making a top and I want to pay myself, let's say $15 an hour, okay? So first of all, I would make the top, time myself, and let's say it took me two hours. So I'm going to start with $30 because I'm paying myself $15 per hour, $15, $15, two hours, that's 30 bucks. 
And then I'm going to look at the yarn. How much yarn did I use? Well, I'm just gonna say I used one skein of Lily Sugar and Cream Cotton, which cost me probably around $6. So at the very least, I should be charging about $36 for the crop top. Everyone's pricing is going to be different. Everyone puts different value on different things. If you're using hourly rate, a lot of people crochet at different rates. So something might take someone one hour that takes another person four hours. At the very least, whenever I started, I just thought whenever I set a price on an item, I wanted to know, do I have enough money to make another one of these? There's lots of different ways to price things, but I would just find what you think is best for you, what makes the most sense in your mind, and what makes you feel the best about selling your product. A related question is, what do I do if someone says my item is too expensive? Don't sell it to them. Somebody else will come along and they will not think that it's too expensive and they will most likely buy it. Do not lower your prices to appease a customer especially if it's only one customer that is complaining about your prices. Next question is, what are some good strategies to market yourself and how do you make sales? So this kind of goes along with one of my points on where do I get started and it is social media. Social media is a huge, huge part of my business. I would definitely not have a full-time business if I didn't start my social media very early. The impact that social media has is huge. That is, I mean, that's basically all of your advertising. You need to post about your products in order for people to even know that your products exist. You need to have a specific social media that is catered to whatever you are selling because a customer is much more likely to buy from a business entity rather than Kelsey Rose 99 loves dogs. Whenever you are making your social media post, you need to think about it as if this person is not following you. They are just looking at this singular post and they have never heard of you before. And this is something that I have been trying to keep reminding myself because I forget to do this all the time. If someone were to look at this post, not click on your name, not look at your page or anything like that, would they know that that item is for sale? Did you say it was for sale? Did you say where it's for sale? Did you say how much it costs? All of that is really important information that should be readily available in the caption. Because I've seen many posts from any kind of business and let's just say they just post a picture and the caption says, isn't this sweater just so adorable? And that's it. I would have no idea that they were actually trying to sell that sweater to me. I would have no idea that if I clicked on their name, I would go to their page and I could see that they have a business. Even if you are putting details in your captions, such as this is for sale at the link in my bio, it is still helpful to put in the actual place that it is for sale. So instead of saying this is for sale at the link in my bio, I would say this is for sale on passionategoods.com or this is for sale at etsy.com slash shop slash passionate goods. You have to realize that a lot of times customers are lazy and a lot of the times they're not actually scrolling through social media looking to buy something. They're not looking for that information. So you need to tell it to them. Once you have your social media started, try to post often, try to use hashtags on all of your posts, try to post really just nice eye-catching photos, try to use natural lighting, try to draw the people in, if you know what I mean. Kind of jumping off of that, our next question is, how do you take good photos of your products? One of the most important things is natural lighting, and you can do this by either taking your pictures outside or if you don't have access to that, you can take your pictures in front of a window. A nice and easy way to take your photos outside is to just walk outside and bring with you some kind of background. Unless you have really nice grass, then you can just lay it in the grass, honestly. I think grass pictures are beautiful sometimes, but I would either take with me like 
a nice clean cute fuzzy blanket or maybe a sheet or you could even just bring a plain white poster board once you are outside try to find some nice spots with good lighting lay out your object and take some pictures you want to take pictures from multiple angles you want to take some pictures in direct sunlight and then maybe try to find a shady area to take pictures that are not in direct sunlight try to make the item the focal point in the picture. I don't want anything in the photo that's going to draw the attention away from the main product. If you're selling a wearable item, it's a really good idea to get a mannequin or a head form or even just put it on yourself and take some photos of what the item actually looks like while it's being worn. You should take a couple photos with your face in it and if you have photos with your face in it, try to make sure you look happy, you look nice, you look presentable, maybe do your hair, smile, you know, whatever makes you feel comfortable. And then you should also just take pictures without your face in them. So I usually like to crop them off like right here at my neck so people can focus more on the product and what it looks like on the body. After you're done taking all of your photos, you should edit them just a little bit. Don't edit them too much. You want the item to look true to color, but you can up the brightness here and there. You can try to take out some items in the background if they're too distracting. Just make the photo look nice. An app that I love to use is called Photo Room. I personally love using this app because it will automatically take out the background for you and you can replace that background with anything. Normally I just put it over a clean, just solid color background. I usually do kind of a light pink. And I mainly use those photos for my website so that people can clearly see the product. Currently I am paying to use the Photo Room app. This is not sponsored, but I did use it for many months before I started paying for it. I would just download the photos and then crop out the watermark afterwards. Don't tell photo room. Whenever you're taking photos, you just wanna be thinking, does this photo showcase my item in the best way? Whenever you look at your photos later on, look at your item and think, would I wanna buy that? And if the answer is yes, then that's great. Our next question is, where is a good place to start selling? Etsy or your own website? If someone is very new, they don't have very many followers, they are just getting into kind of sharing on the social media websites, then I would say that Etsy is honestly a very nice place to start. That is where I started personally and I think it was pretty good for me. I would suggest selling on Etsy to someone that is new to the business because Etsy does advertise their products on the website. Etsy already is big, it has a lot of customers and people will just go to Etsy specifically to look for handmade items. So there is a possibility of someone finding your items for sale on Etsy even though they have never seen you before. That same possibility of someone randomly stumbling upon your items on your own personal website is much, much lower. I would recommend starting on Etsy or some other place where people are already shopping so that they can have the possibility of finding your items rather than starting your own website because people generally will only go to your website through your social media. All right, next, which is better, having stock or taking custom orders. I think that having a healthy mix of both is honestly the best option, or at least that's the best option for me personally. I think at first you should start with having stock because you're going to need photos, of course, and you're going to need kind of like a big portfolio. It's really good to do once you're starting out because generally whenever you're starting, orders are kind of slow. So you have a lot of time to actually build up a good inventory. Once you have a nice inventory, you feel like it's full. Whenever you look at your shop or your website, it feels like it is a nice shopping experience and the customers will have a lot of options. Then I think it's a really good idea to introduce a custom order option if that is something that you yourself are interested in doing. Personally, I currently really like to emphasize having stock with my business because in the past I have taken on many, many custom orders and I have been overwhelmed and every time I have custom orders, at some point I get burnt out. But whenever I am just making stock, I feel I have more freedom to make things that I want to make 
and my website looks more full it looks more inviting it looks more like a thriving business so i guess based on that i'm gonna say that my first focus would be having stock and then once you have stock custom orders is also a great idea since we're talking about making sales we should also probably talk about what to do after you've actually made a sale so our next question is how does shipping work so after someone buys your item you should be provided with their address from there you will take that address and make a shipping label so the first thing you should do is take all of the items or just the item that have been ordered and you should package that item you can package it in multiple different ways. I mean, if you've received mail before, you probably know what a package looks like. If it's a small item like a sticker or something that's pretty, you know, small and flat, you can put it in an envelope. If you want to do just the very basic shipping with an envelope, you can just write their address right on the front, write the return address in the top corner, and then put the stamp on the front, close up the envelope and put it in your mailbox. Most of the time, whenever you're selling items, it's gonna be something that's a little bit bigger, so you're gonna to have to put it in a package of sorts. There's multiple ways you can package physical items. You can use poly mailers, which is what I use most of the time. It is just a shipping bag, plastic. You just throw your item in there. This is a little peely thing. It's sticky under there. Peel it off, fold it over. There you go, got your package. You can also use a box. Take the item, put it in the box, tape up the box, there you go. If you have anything breakable, I would suggest using a box with padding or you can use a bubble mailer, which is basically exactly like the poly mailer, but it is filled with bubble wrap. You can buy all of these shipping materials in stores. Walmart has pretty much all of this stuff, I think. You can go to an office supply store like Staples or Office Depot. You could actually just go to the post office or you can order it online if you want something beautiful. I buy these online. I buy them from upackandship.com. It is the cheapest place that I think that I found them. It's also a small business. They have lots of cute designs, not sponsored. They also sell poly mailers like this, bubble mailers and boxes. There's lots of sizes lots of choices and yeah I just buy them online once you have your order all packaged up and ready to go you're going to need some information in order to buy the shipping label that information is going to be how big is your package so you're gonna to have to measure it I always have a ruler handy you're gonna to need to measure the length the width and the height so let's say this is my package here I'm gonna measure the length which is the longest part this is five inches long. I'm gonna measure the width, which is opposite of the length, just the other way. This is three inches wide. And then I'm gonna to need to measure the height, which is up the side. How tall is it? And this is two inches tall, okay? So I'm gonna write down five, what did I say? Five by three by uh, two and a half. Next, you're going to have to weigh this because the price of the shipping depends on how big it is and how heavy it is. If something is small and lightweight, it's going to cost less than something that is huge and really heavy because, I mean, shipping something that's huge and really heavy is much harder than shipping something that is light and easy to carry. I have purchased a scale so that I can weigh all of my packages at home. This is actually just a food scale that I bought from Amazon. It was really simple. These are like... 20 to 40 dollars i believe most of my packages that i ship are relatively small i can even fit like sweater packages on here no problem just make sure that you buy a scale that can measure pounds and ounces if you don't want to buy a scale you can just take your finished packed item to the post office and they can measure it and weigh it for you the last vital piece of information that we're going to need is the customer's address we will be entering all of that information into the computer in order to buy the shipping label. If you're selling on a platform such as Etsy or Shopify or Wix, for example, they pretty much all have their own shipping software for you to use on that website. So for example, on Etsy, you would go to the order and you would click buy shipping label. From there, it'll take you to a screen. You just enter all of that information. It should already have the customer's address preloaded because that's where they bought the item. So all you're gonna to have to do is enter the item measurements and the weight. 
From there, you can choose what kind of carrier you want. You can choose USPS, FedEx, UPS, DHL, I don't know. They're all gonna have different prices and they should also tell you an estimated time of arrival. So you can choose the cheapest option or you can choose a more expensive option that's gonna get there faster, whatever you would like to do really. From there, you will confirm. It's going to generate a shipping label for you that's gonna have their address, it's gonna have the tracking number, it's gonna have everything on it. It's basically like a big stamp. And what you're gonna need to do from there is you're going to need to print that out and put it on your package. So I myself have purchased a laser printer that prints off the labels onto a sticker so that I can just print it out on the sticker, put the sticker on the package, leave it at that. But I didn't buy that until I had already been running my business for multiple years because it was not a necessary item and it cost quite a bit of money. I personally purchased a Dymo Label Writer 4XL. I think it was pretty expensive, but there's a lot of cheaper options on the market like a, a Rolo or something. If you don't want to buy a laser printer, that's totally understandable. You can just print it out on regular printer paper. After you print it out on regular printer paper, I would just cut it out because it's gonna be about half the size of the regular sheet. And then you're gonna wanna buy some packing tape, clear packing tape like this, so that you can take the packing tape and put the label onto the package. And you want to cover the entire label with the tape so that just in case the package gets rained on or something like that, none of the actual shipping label is going to run since it's printed on regular paper. So I would just take strips of tape, cover the whole thing, get it on the package, make sure it's not gonna go anywhere, it's not gonna get ruined or anything like that. And then once you have that done, your package is good to go. You can just hand it to the mailman, drop it off at a post office or anything like that, and it will get shipped to your customer. If you don't wanna do any of that at home, what you can do is once you receive your order, you're gonna write down the customer's address and you're gonna take your item. And then you can go to the post office and you can give them the address, give them the item, and say, I need to package this and I need to ship it to this address and then you can work with them on finding packaging. You can pack it up. They will measure the package for you and weigh the package for you, and then they will print off the shipping label as well. You're gonna have to pay them for the label. Labels generally cost about $5 if you're shipping inside the US. It might be more than that if you go to an actual post office. I know it's cheaper, I think, if you purchase them from your computer at home. Don't know why. From there, they should ask if you want a receipt. The receipt should have a tracking number and then what you should do with that tracking number is you should come back home and you should put that tracking number into the computer onto the order if you have that option with whatever website you're selling through so that the customer can have access to that tracking number. It's not something that you have to do, it's just something that is considerate. But at the very least, what you would have to do is if you went that route is you would just have to go into the order and mark it as shipped so that the order is closed on the website, Etsy or Shopify, and you don't have to worry about it anymore. So basically that's how it works. Shipping was extremely intimidating to me whenever I started my business. And then after I shipped my first package, I was like, that was so easy. <laughs> I don't know why I was freaking out about it. So I understand that it can seem like a lot. It can seem really hard whenever you are first starting out, but once you actually do it, it is a pretty easy process. Our next question is how do you decide what to make? I think whenever you're deciding on things to make and sell, it should be a nice mix of things that you like making, things that you enjoy making, that you don't mind making over and over again. And then also I think it's a good idea here and there to dip into trends that you might see in the crochet world if you're good at making them. Like if I see an amigurumi trend, I'm not gonna hop on that trend, but if I see a fun clothing trend that I think will be good for sales, then I might make a few of them. The main focus should definitely be things that you are good at making and enjoy making and then a fun little side focus here and there is whenever you see something trending, don't be afraid to make it. It might get you some really good sales. Next, we wanna know how do you not lose motivation whenever you're not making any sales? Coming from someone that has had lots of times where sales were just 
a lot, overwhelming. I had so many orders I couldn't even think. And that's a great thing, not complaining. But now, seeing it from the other side, I look at times where I have no orders as an opportunity for me to focus on things that I like making rather than making 100 spiderweb tops. Um, it's a really, really good time to try writing a pattern, to make stock, to film some YouTube videos if you're interested in doing that. It's a really good time to build up on social media posts, take a lot of pictures, bulk make your content, make TikToks, go ahead and like plan out your social media posts while you have time, schedule your content, pre-write your captions, stuff like that. Whenever you have no sales and you feel like there's nothing for you to do, there is always something for you to do because you should always be planning, you should always be working because that planning and that time where you are making stock, you're making content, that is going to help you get back into making sales. So if you are feeling a little bit demotivated, you're feeling a little bit sad, just think about this time as an opportunity time for you to work on your business, for you to write patterns, for you to do anything that you want really. And then think about how if and when you have a successful and booming business, you're going to enjoy the days where you don't have any orders. The rest of our questions are mainly about me and my business personally, so if you find that interesting, stick around. First is how did you get started and were you confident? So I started crocheting whenever I was 13 and I was crocheting on and off. You know, I was in school, I was in color guard, I was busy. So I was just, I was just having fun really. I got very into it though. I was, I loved it. I loved crochet so much. I started an Instagram that was fully dedicated to crochet. But at that time, I hadn't really planned on it turning into a business. I just thought it would be cool or something. After crocheting for a few years, sometime in high school, I had people that I knew start asking me if I would make stuff for them and they were gonna pay for it. So I was like, oh yeah, that's great. So uh, my first sales were friends and family in person, kind of just cash sales here and there. And whenever I was 16 or 17, I think I really wanted to start an Etsy. I looked into it a lot and then I found out that you couldn't start an Etsy technically until you're 18. My mom offered to put in her information so that she would technically be the owner of the Etsy store and I would make the stuff, but I didn't want to do that. Not because of my mom, I just really wanted the business to be fully mine. So I waited until I turned 18 and then as soon as I was 18, well probably like a couple months after, I made my Etsy shop and I put up some stuff for sale and that's where I started. At that point I had been working on my crochet social media for a while, it was just Instagram really, and I think that I had about 500 followers or something whenever I started my business and I was actually selling things. At that point, I did not expect for it to be a full-time business at all. I thought it was just kind of like a side gig to make some extra money because it was fun and because I was crocheting a lot, honestly, and I didn't know what to do with all of the stuff that was filling up my room. At this point, I also did have a job. I was working at a fast food restaurant and I was still going to school and I was like, it was really just a side project for me. Seeing all of that, I'm gonna say that no, I was not confident. I don't think I was confident that it was gonna turn into a fully functioning business in my future, but I mean, I was just having fun, you know? So that's how I got started. Next, they wanna know, was it a long time before your business started picking up? The answer to that is definitely. Since it started as kind of a, a side gig, it was definitely a slow start. It took me a lot of years. I was just making a little bit of money here and there and I never quit my job or anything like that. So I had my Etsy and I was selling on there for at least two to three years before I went full-time crochet. Yeah, I started my Etsy in 
2017 because that's whenever I turned 18 and then I quit my job in 2020 so it took about three years the next question is related it says did you quit your job immediately or was it a gradual move it was absolutely gradual I do not suggest quitting your job if you know your crochet business just starts to take off I had been working on my business for quite some time and I was I was in a good spot my business had been very consistent as far as income for about at least six months and I knew that I was going to have enough money to survive to pay my rent and I wouldn't have any problems so at that point is when I decided I, I could probably quit my job right now and I would be fine and then my crochet business started outweighing my actual full-time job I was like you know like I need to take days off from my job because my crochet business is so busy so at that point I was ready I knew that I was in a safe spot to where if I quit my job then I would not die what am I trying to say I fully knew and I was prepared that my crochet business was enough to support me financially otherwise I would not have left my job you know try to be responsible I don't want anyone going broke or anything like that do you have more profit from selling physical items or patterns I think that this is a really good question because patterns are a huge part of my crochet business I've just kind of done my taxes so I think this is like a really good time to ask that question looking at the numbers from 2023 pattern sales I am going to just estimate here they would probably make at least 30 to 40 percent of the sales which is a really good chunk honestly if you have a crochet business I think that patterns are an amazing amazing tool to use it is a really really good source of passive income because you write the pattern once and after it's written you don't really have to do anything else yes it's a lot of work designing and writing the pattern but I think that it pays for itself over time honestly it is a really really great thing to have because even if let's say I'm having a hard time with my hands hurting or I don't have time to crochet or I'm just working on other projects then selling a pattern or a few patterns every day is really really great super super helpful in keeping your business afloat at times how do you stay prepared for taxes throughout the year just so you guys know generally most websites where you can sell items they do not take out your taxes for you like a normal job does so you're gonna have to file all of your taxes and pay like a huge sum of money at the end of the year there's multiple ways to do it you can do it all at once at the end of the year which can kind of be a big ouchie or you can pay quarterly payments if you want that's probably much smarter but anyway the question was how do you prepare for taxes throughout the year and my answer to that is uh, basically I just I don't I don't spend any of my money since I have multiple sources of income I will funnel them into different places so all of my sales from one website will go into one place and I don't really touch those sales because I I've told myself that money is for my taxes and I'm just gonna ignore it and pretend that it doesn't exist so that at the end of the year whenever I have to pay that big amount of tax money then it's not going to hurt me emotionally <laughs> and then my other revenues of income they can go into another account and I can just use that for like my normal expenses like my rent and my groceries and stuff like that so um, I mean I just try to be smart with my spending I try to be aware of how much money I have and kind of how much money I'm going to need to pay in taxes at the end of the year so I am prepared for that I would definitely look into getting an accountant that can help you with that kind of stuff if you're interested in that but just know that if you are wanting to start your own business taxes are gonna be a thing for sure the last question that I have is why did I switch from Etsy to Shopify 
So as we've already stated, I started my business on Etsy. I was selling everything on Etsy. I was selling my tops, physical products, everything that I made. I was selling it on Etsy as well as my patterns. And now I sell all of my physical handmade items on Shopify as well as my patterns. And my Etsy is still open. I just, I only sell patterns on Etsy. And the reason is that, first of all, Etsy's fees are very high. So I did say it is a really good place to start because there's a lot of shoppers that are already on Etsy. So if you are a small business that's just starting out, it's a good place to find exposure. But now that I have a platform of my own, it's more like I am bringing people to Etsy, not Etsy is bringing people to me. So instead, I opted for making my own website, which I used Shopify. You can also use Wix or Squarespace. And I'm pretty sure all of them have lower fees than Etsy. So since I knew that I had a loyal following, I have exposure, I have my own means of bringing people to my products, then I would have no issues opening my own website because people would be able to find my website through my post and my social media. So that is why I switched because there's lower fees and then I would have no worries about whether or not I would get customers or not. Also, I really liked the idea of having my own area. You know, like an Etsy shop is just a little shop on Etsy and Etsy is full of a ton of shops and you can't customize it very much. So just think like, having a website was like fun and cool and great. I have no complaints as far as switching goes. It was definitely better in the long run just because of the fees. And well, guys, I think that is all the questions that I had written down for today. I would love to know if this video answered any of your questions, if you're feeling any better about maybe opening up your own crochet brand. Did you learn anything new? Was it helpful? Did you wanna know anything more? Were my answers kind of what you thought or did you hear something different today anyway that's all leave your comments down below give this video a thumbs up if it helped at all and subscribe to my channel if you're new i'll see you guys next time bye